Hey everyone, today's video is about fixing big hernias, or more specifically, uh, component separation and the role it plays in abdominal wall reconstruction. Now this is definitely going to be a basics video. I'll link some minimally invasive surgeons videos uh, that are available on YouTube that go into this in much more detail, uh, but hopefully for the uh, level of learner we're targeting, this is still a useful contribution. So the first thing when it comes to any sort of hernia surgery is you really need to know your anatomy. And often it's deceptively, seems deceptively simple in the textbook, but can be quite difficult uh, in real life. And so you'll find yourself learning this from your first day of intern year until you graduate residency and probably far beyond that if you continue operating on hernias. So just a quick review, the basic anatomy. These are a couple of uh, axial or transverse images of the abdominal wall. And just to orient you, this is skin up here at the top. So down here is designed to be the intraperitoneal space. And then we have roughly our fascial layer of the abdomen, which is, of course, where hernias happen, um, which are addressed by component separation and whatnot. So just a brief review, um, we have three lateral muscles and then our medial muscles, so our three lateral muscles are the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transverse abdominis. Medially, we have the rectus muscles here. Then deep to all that, we have the transversalis fascia, which is this thin line right here. And of course, below that, there's the peritoneal layer. A couple other important landmarks in the middle of all of this, we have the linea alba. That's where all the fascial aponeuroses fuse together. And out here laterally, we have the linea semilunaris, where the aponeuroses from the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverses abdominis all come together and then above the arcuate line, they split. And here we have the anterior and the posterior layers of the rectus sheath. So anterior rectus sheath here, posterior rectus sheath here. Uh, but below the arcuate line, of course, they all go anterior. So we just have an anterior rectus sheath below the arcuate line. And just to review, of course, the arcuate line is roughly one third of the distance between the umbilicus and the pubic synthesis. So the majority of the abdominal wall is more in this configuration. So that's a good start, but there's a couple more things I want to point out in detail uh, before we talk about component separations. So for a more focused anatomy, um, this is just half of the abdominal wall. We'll focus mostly above the arcuate line here. Um, so this is medial or the midline right here, and this is more lateral. So just to draw your attention or orient you here again, we have our rectus abdominis, then we have external oblique, internal oblique, transverses abdominis. Back here is transversalis. This is how they represent fat here, subcutaneous fat, preperitoneal fat, and of course, peritoneum all the way in here, skin all the way out there. So two things that I really think uh, people often miss in their basic review of anatomy that make it hard for them to understand what's going on in the component separation. And those two things are the retrorectus space and then the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. So the retrorectus space is actually pretty simple. It's all in the name. It's just the space directly behind the rectus abdominis that's going to get dissected out in certain types of component separations. So we'll see more about that later. And then the lamella of the internal oblique. So remember, this is these are aponeuroses right here, right? They're going to fuse together to form the anterior and posterior rectus sheets. So this is, of course, the external oblique aponeurosis, internal and transverse abdominis aponeurosis. But what about this little split right here? So that split you see only happens for the internal oblique. And that split, these layers are called lamella. So this is the anterior lamella and this is the posterior lamella. So if I were to point out the posterior lamella of the interior oblique, that is this layer of tissue right there. The other thing to know is that the perforators that come in and feed the rectus, they run roughly here as well and at the very top of the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. That's all going to come into play later. I just want to make sure you have this uh, terminology before we go on. All right, so to step back a bit and review, what is the actual problem that we're dealing with with a large hernia? And primarily, the problem is, of course, the hernia itself. There's a large gap in the fascia with a bunch of intra-abdominal contents, organs, etc., cetera, uh, protruding through it. Um, of course, the reason that gap is there is usually because the tissue is inadequate. And unfortunately, if the tissue has been there for a while, or if the hernia has been there for a while, I should say, then the tissue has certainly become 
very weak and inadequate from the wear and tear over time. So we need a way to fix these large gaps in the fascia because with those gaps, you can imagine if you have one rectus over here and one all the way over here, you know, how is this space going to function as the abdominal wall? Even if you put some sort of, some sort of a tissue or layer between those two, if they're completely disconnected from each other, the abdomen's not going to be able to contract and function like it normally would. <clears throat> and so the, the goal or what needs to be solved by component separations is, do we have a way that we can close those large gaps in the fascia and do so in a way where we can put strength into these closures so it can do its job over the long term? And the easy answer is, oh, yeah, just, just put some mesh in there. What's wrong with that? Um, and while mesh is certainly an important part of a good component separation repair, it's not enough to just take any defect and throw some mesh on it. For one, mesh is not a functional abdominal wall. It can't contract. It can't do any of the other functions of the abdominal cavity. Uh, and then the other problem is, where do you put this mesh? It's a problem of a large foreign body especially when you think about intraperitoneal placement of mesh. So mesh on that innermost layer of the abdominal wall, where it would be sitting right next to the bowel, it's a very high risk of infection, of long-term issues with erosion into the bowel contents itself, intercutaneous fistulas, etc. cetera. Um, on the other hand, where else could you put a mesh? Um, when you just do a midline incision, there's essentially the skin on top and the peritoneum on the inside. So there's not really a good place to put the mesh that doesn't put it in contact with the bowel. Um, however, if we perform a component separation, um, which is broadly defined as dividing a component of the abdominal wall, which is usually one of these lateral three abdominal wall muscles, uh, to facilitate a hernia repair, this will solve both problems in one fell swoop. Um, it will allow us to close a large defect in the fascia because cutting one of those layers gives us a lot of length to pull things to the midline. And it will also, through the dissection we use to do that component separation, give us a space to put our mesh in where it doesn't have to lay here intraperitoneally and come into contact with the bowel. So a line I read while I was researching for this video that I really liked was the idea that you sacrifice one of these lateral three layers to close a major defect in the middle of the abdominal wall. And that um, that was basically the idea when people came up with this was like, well, I mean, obviously these three muscles all have a purpose, but two of them can kind of do the job uh, when obviously if there's some full thickness defect here that's 10 centimeters apart, obviously we're not having full function anyway. So you take a little bit of a sacrifice here where you can um, in order to restore a whole lot of the functionality of the abdominal wall. And of course, prevent potential complications from hernias like bowel obstructions, uh, ischemia and incarceration etc. It's really quite remarkable how much these can help close those defects as well. Um, most textbooks will say you can get about 20 centimeters of mobilization um, just by releasing these muscles, which sounds pretty incredible uh, until you've, you've actually seen it done. All right, so again, if we go back to those problems, if we do a component separation, uh, that will give us a way to close those large gaps in the fascia and solve the problem of weak tissue by giving us a good space uh, to put the mesh in where it will both do its job, provide the strength, and be unlikely to have complications. So now to dive a little bit deeper into component separation, there's two main types. Um, there's the posterior and the anterior component separations. Now I put posterior first. Um, anterior was actually the first one done, but uh, it is not the preferred approach anymore. So that's why I listed posterior first. The posterior approach is often called a TAR, T-A-R, for standing for transversus abdominis release, whereas the anterior uh, or EOR stands for external oblique release. And again, if you're thinking about your layers of the abdominal wall, of course, the uh, external oblique is closest to the skin. So it's the most anterior, whereas the transversus abdominis was closest to the peritoneum, so it's the most posterior, hence the naming conventions. All right, so we'll talk about the more popular uh, kind of preferred repair first, the posterior transversus abdominis release. So um, again, this is kind of a similar 
image to the ones we've been looking at where we're looking at a transverse cut through the abdominal wall. This is the midline, this is lateral. So this all starts, and this is done open. This could, of course, be done laparoscopic or robotic, but I think open is the easiest to learn about the technique. So if you imagine that you've made a midline incision here, you actually end up lifting the abdominal wall up, usually with some copers or something attached here. And then you go about a centimeter or two from the midline on the posterior side of the rectus abdominis. And then you cut through the posterior rectus sheath there. That's what this incision is demonstrating. Then here is that retro rectus space we talked about, where we take the rectus to the ceiling and everything else to the floor and separate that space until we get in to hit this layer. Now, they don't do a great job of drawing that out there, so I put this image here. I know it's the opposite side, so again, just bear with me, medial, lateral. But it's the same basic idea, because you usually do, do this on both sides. So imagine you've made your incision here. You um, go on the underside of rectus, maybe about a centimeter, divide that, and then dissect along here to, to create your rectorectus space. When you get to the back, you're gonna run into that posterior lamella, of the internal oblique. Remember that key structure, the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. And you're going to divide that to get into this plane. And you want to divide it in a space that will pre preserve those perforators that we talked about that run roughly here, the neurovascular perforators that supply the rectus abdominis. Then once you're in this space, you're in the space between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. And this is where the transversus abdominis release comes in. We actually divide through the muscle of the transversus transversus abdominis, and that puts you um, in that space below it where now you have all the muscle, essentially all the strength components of the abdominal wall above you, and you're able to push those up, dissect down the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum, and continue dissecting in this space. And that dissection can continue all the way around, almost back to the spine. So if you picture it, and this is kind of supposed to be that finished product down here, you can create this massive posterior, almost bio bag or bio bandage where all the bowels and intestines and everything you don't want mesh by is down here. You can close that off nicely. So this is, you know, peritoneum, transversalis fascia, et cetera, and then put a giant piece of mesh up there in that space where it's not going to hurt anything. And then above that, you've got this really nicely released abdominal wall that can come together nicely in the center, in the center where we can get several, you know, tens of centimeters of mobilization just from that alone. So we recreate our abdominal wall anatomy, get a big, strong piece of mesh in here where it needs to be and have that be far away from the bowel. And again, just to, to show that same thing again. So we start, let's say we started the midline. We came here on the underside of rectus, cut through that posterior rectus sheath, dissected our way out this way, ran into that posterior lamella of the internal oblique, divided through that, then we hit the transversus abdominis. We divide it through that muscle too. Then we push everything up and then just the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum down. We dissect it out this way. And that gave us that nice uh, release and then the space to put in our mesh. I think the easiest way to think about this for me is um, step one, you know, think about making your incision. Step two, think about developing a retrorectus space where the muscle goes up and everything right below the rectus goes down. And then think about kind of cutting the fewest layers I can, preserving the blood supply, preserving the muscles, etc., to just allow myself to get most of the strength layers and the working layers of the, the abdominal wall up, kind of on the ceiling of the dissection. And all you really need below you is just a protective layer of the bowel. So you're always kind of trying to dive a layer down in this dissection. Um, so all you have is essentially this thin, almost cell thick layer of protection, but all the strength layers can come together. So I'm not sure if it'll help, but that's how I kind of think about it. All right, that was a lot, but we'll just briefly talk about the anterior or the external oblique release. We'll talk less about this because again, it's the less preferred repair. I've actually seen very few of these in comparison to the posterior release. But the basic idea, again, this is demonstrated open <clears throat> is you make your incision, you make a midline incision. And for this one, you actually have to make a large lateral skin flap because that's how you end up getting to the external oblique. And then once you've exposed the external, external oblique, then you go and cut the aponeurosis of the external oblique and just completely divide this external oblique from the abdominal wall. 
then you also, and this is why the name can sometimes be, just be confusing, you also go posteriorly and you again divide the posterior rectus sheath, just like you did at the beginning of the TAR release, um, and open up, mobilize the rectus from the posterior rectus sheath. And then you can see how releasing here, releasing here would allow this to mobilize medially and allow you to close that release um, with, again, some good extra length and medialization. Um, the question here then becomes, where are you going to put the mesh? Um, unfortunately, this little dissection retrorectus, if you're doing a big release, is probably not going to be enough space for you to put a big enough mesh with a nice overlap. So your two options are really putting the mesh in an onlay position up here over top of everything or in an intraperitoneal position, uh, which unfortunately puts it right by the bowel and has the associated problems we talked about earlier. So that's one of many reasons why the posterior or the tar release is generally preferred over the external oblique release. Some other advantages. So first, just greater mobilization. It can actually get you closer to the midline um, close off more space than the anterior release. Um, there's a great natural pocket for the mesh. It doesn't require big skin flaps. Big skin flaps mean big seromas. Big seromas means high risk of wound infections, wound complications. And of course, especially if there's a mesh in that infected wound, now you've got an infected mesh and a really bad problem. So a tar has a great natural pocket. Uh, an anterior release, an external oblique release does not. Um, that's one of the reasons why the tar is preferred. Again, no skin flaps with their associated wound complications. And you can use an ideal mesh, um, which is usually an uh, uncoated polypropylene mesh. And these meshes are very inexpensive, so you can put a huge piece in. Uh, they're resilient to infection, and they just do their job really well. Um, some less ideal mes meshes, for example, if you had to put an intraperitoneal mesh on that, all the way on the inside of an external oblique release, that'd be right next to the bowel. So you need a coated mesh or a dual layer mesh those are much more expensive. Um, they're also, again, at higher risk of infection or long-term complications. All right, big video, a lot of information, um, but just to review kind of the most important points, number one is anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. I'm always relearning more about this anatomy, and some of the videos I link can go in much more depth than we have here. So just never think you've learned the abdominal wall anatomy and you're done with it. Always keep going back, always keep reviewing it, and that will keep helping you understand uh, these big, complex, reconstructive cases. Uh, the second point I wanted to review is those two problems of big hernias. So remember that we need to close a big defect and we need to do it with strength, and that component separations uh, really fix both of those problems by giving us medialization or um, the ability for us to close that big defect uh, closer functional down the wall so it can start to function somewhat normally again. And then it also gives us a way to put in a big piece of mesh to reinforce our repair. Um, and then finally, we reviewed the two types of component separation. Remember, number one, uh, the ideal is the posterior or the transverse abdominus release, uh, but there is also the anterior or external oblique release as well. And that's it. These videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases. This is not clinical advice. We will see you next time.